Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I need a volunteer who's willing to come up and help me out. Not for long. Just need you to string out this string. I think if you take that end, I'll take this end and you take that and just kind of let it wound off. It's going to tangle, I'm afraid, but we're going to try. And I will uh, let that happen. I will talk a little bit while that, he's stringing that out. My sermon's called A Whale of a Tale. You would think for somebody who's worked on computers for 30 years, I'd have this down, but you know, I wrote the sermon and I brought a paper copy just in case. What I like to do is introduce you to the players in this story. Now, first of all, we've got a city called Nineveh. It's an Assyrian city, and the Assyrians are basically everybody's enemy. When the Assyrians come to town, you best flee because they take great pleasure in the ways that they can found or the ways they have found to kill you, to torture you. If they don't kill you outright in fighting, they'll kill you anyway. And when uh, before they go out in Nineveh, which at the time was the capital, um, the king was a very busy man because they had so many gods, and each god had to be appeased, and it was the king's job to do it. And so he would do, he would have this advisor would come in, and you couldn't come before the king unless you were blindfolded because you weren't supposed to see the the representative of of the god. So his advisor would come in and they'd do whatever sacrifice he needed for this god and he'd leave and the next one would come in and then the next one would come in and he had all these advisors that did the jobs that he need, you know, that he sent them out to do. And if they overran a kingdom, they adopted their gods too. So then they brought in some more. When Babylon said, we're not paying you anymore. So he goes down and sacks Babylon and he brings the Babylonian god Marduk they take his statue and everything and drag it back to Ashur. And the people, the Assyrians that believed in Marduk said, oh, you shouldn't have done that because now Marduk's going to be angry with you and, and we'll get destroyed. And, and they did eventually. And some of the, if you, if you want to spend the afternoon, you can open your concordance and look up Assyria and read all things in the Bible about the Assyrians. It'll take you all afternoon. It's nasty. But they lived there, the the famous ones that we know to history would be like Sargon II and Sennacherib, uh, Tiglath-Pileser. Sennacherib, he's the one that came down and laid siege to Jerusalem. And in 2 Kings 2, or 2 Kings 19.35 says, and it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead. Sennacherib's stelae is in the Oriental Museum over in Chicago. And Jerusalem is listed as cities, all the cities that he's conquered. Jerusalem is listed, but not as conquered. Now this is the siege where Hezekiah has this tunnel dug to bring the water into the city. And it's, there's an inscription in the tunnel that says that they started on each end and met in the middle. Now that's an amazing feat to start digging on two ends of a mountain and meet in the middle. How do you keep your direction straight? And there's only a couple of inches difference where, the meet, where they meet. So they were pretty good at what they did. Now, the ruins of Nineveh are right across the river 
from the modern city of Mosul in Iraq. It's a heap of rubble. Another player in this story is Israel. Now, after Solomon died, his sons were reigning and the, the uh, taxes were so high and the 10 northern kingdoms says, we're not paying them anymore and they split off and they became Israel and the two other tribes became Judea or Judah. Judah and Benjamin created that kingdom. When the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom in 721 BC, those 10 tribes were moved. You see, the Assyrians, they ruled by fear. And if you weren't afraid of them, they'd come over and make you afraid of them. And they found out that that didn't work so good because when they left, everybody hated them, so they rebelled again, and they'd have to go back and do it again. So they finally did was they walked in and they took the 10 tribes and they dispersed them throughout their whole kingdom. They'd take... They didn't leave them in town groups. Anyway, they took them as individuals and put them all over so that eventually they just assimilated into the rest of the world, or then known world. Thus they've disappeared. Of course, nevertheless, a belief persists to this day that those tribes are going to be found. Elah, Eladad, Don, Hadani, for instance, a 9th century Jewish traveler reported locating the tribe, those tribes beyond the river's of Abyssinia. Reportedly, on the far side of an impassable river called the Sabbatation, a roaring torrent of stones that would become subdued only on the Sabbath, but since Jews can't travel on Sabbath, they couldn't get out of there. Manasseh ben Israel used the legend of the Ten Tribes pleading successfully for admission of Jews into England during Oliver Cromwell's regime. Some of the various peoples and tribes of people that who have been associated or thought to be descendants of the lost tribes are Assyrian Christians, the Mormons, the Afghans, the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, the American Indian, and the Japanese. Among the numerous immigrants to the state of Israel since its establishment in 1948, there are a few who likewise claim to be remnants of the Lost Ten Tribes. Now the next pl place we need to talk about is Joppa. It's a biblical town, today it's known as Jaffa. It's been one of the oldest ports, seaports in the world. Tel Aviv has grown up around it, and, but it's still there, it's still a port, but mainly it's just fishing vessels today. There's quite a sizable Arab, Christian, and Muslim population. The name Joppa appears for the first time on a list of cities that Tutmosis III captured in the 15th century BC. It has the oldest functioning harbor in the world. When they were building Solomon's temple, cedars from Lebanon were floated down to Joppa and then transported to Jerusalem. Jaffa was the main port of entry during the Turkish period and pilgrims and visitors would enter the Holy Land from there. Would, would you stretch that out, please? Pull it out as far as we can get it. Take it to the back of the church or however far it'll reach. If you have to, uh, take it around out to the door. We'll see if we can find a hundred feet. Uh, Java, Jaffa is located about 30 miles south of Caesarea. The modern population is about 60,000. Now Caesarea was the port that the uh, Romans built. It was just a seaside area and they decided we need a port here so they just built a concrete port out into there. And it can still be seen today, but it's not no longer in use. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we're not going to get 100 feet, are we? Okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay, the next place we want to talk about is Tarshish. Now, Tarshish occur, occurs in the Bible a couple of times, and it's probably a large city or region, but nobody knows where it is. There's no uh, ancient village called Tarshish. There's no land called Tarshish. It's kind of a... Nobody knows. They think it might have been the city of Carthage. But there's no proof of that. It could be as far away as Spain. And it may just mean just that, a faraway place. So legends have grown up around it, but nobody can pinpoint it. So next thing we're going to talk about is some of these sailors. Now, we just stretched out this string, and I had 100 feet of string. As you can see, we ran out of church. Uh, a Phoenician fishing boat or merchant boat is about 50 feet long, so maybe about the length of the sanctuary. They were rounded on both ends, and they had a square sail in the middle. They had oars. If they were a warship, they had lots of oars. But they would carry cargo, and then the crew lived on the back, and they would go from island to island. Some of them, in fact, they had... They would stop in one place and pick up ingots of copper. In another place, they'd pick up tin. Another place, they might pick up iron. And they'd have a forge on board. Oh, we're going to such and such place. What do they buy? Well, we'll forge what they make. And they'd make it on board as they, as they were sailing there. Another player in this story, it's always called Jonah and the whale. But it wasn't a whale. It couldn't have been a whale. But just the same, we're going to talk a little bit about whales. Blue whales are the largest animals to ever live on the planet. They reach a maximum length of about 110 feet. My, this, my string was 100 foot, and we couldn't stretch it out in here. And the interesting thing about them, 110 foot long animal, you know, huge, probably 20 foot in diameter, they eat some of the smallest things in the ocean. I had an almond last night, and I measured it, and it measured about the same as what they eat. They eat a krill. It's a small crustacean. It's about between a half and three quarters of an inch long. So the almond I had measured three quarters of an inch. So think, if you had to eat almonds or something the size of an almond every day, how many would you need to eat to survive? Now, you can figure, figure it out if you weighed 330,000 pounds, how many of those would you have to eat in a day? They will swim around, they'll find a, the krill, they will swim around the edge and the krill will panic and they will come together and come together and they'll keep going around them until they get them in a nice tight circle. Then they'll dive below them, they'll open their mouth and come right up and fill their bellies with them. Largest animal in the world, and they eat one of the smallest. But they don't eat humans. They're mammals. They come up to the surface, they breathe air, just like you and I. They can dive to, well, average depth is probably 100 meters because that's where their food source is. But they've been known to dive as, far as 500 meters. And they can come out of the water almost the full body length. So if you're on that 50-foot ship and you're cruising along and this whale broaches next to you and comes 80 feet out of the water and leaves 20 foot of his tail in the water, what are you going to think? Wow. <laughs> and when he comes down, you are going to get wet. They've been known to dive to 500 meters. And just for a little reference, the... World War II German Type 7 U-boat could dive to 230 meters safely. And they would crush at somewhere between 250 and 295 meters, or about 820 to 960 feet. So the whale could dive 
way below him, and he doesn't have a steel shell. He has no... It's just amazing what they can do. Now, let's talk about a fish. Because it says in the Bible that God sent a fish. A special fish, obviously. Did you know that if you go out here to payload to the lake, and you catch a nice bluegill, but it's too small really to keep, and you open his mouth and you see, man, my hook is way down in there, you know, and if you try to get that hook out, you'll kill him. So if you just cut the line and put them back, in three days their stomach acid will dissolve that hook. They don't swim around for that hook very long. So imagine how strong that acid is. What if you're in their belly? How long are you going to last? So God had to design a special fish, one that wouldn't digest Jonah, and one that would provide enough oxygen for him to survive. Now, some people theorize that he actually died in the ocean, and when the whale or the fish spit him out, then he was resurrected. It doesn't say that, but that's some people's theory. So now we're going to get to Jonah himself. Now, Jonah, it, his name means a dove. He's the son of Amatea of Gath Hephron. He's a prophet of Israel, and he predicts the restoration of ancient boundaries. You know, see 2 Kings 14, 25 through 27. He exercised his ministry in the early reign of Jeroboam II, and thus was contemporary with Hosea and Amos. Or possibly he preceded them. He was also the most famous foreign missionary and the most successful. He's from the land of Zebulun in northern Israel. Now, in the back of your Bibles, there's probably maps. You can see where Zebulun is. It's between the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee, but it doesn't touch either of them. It's kind of tucked in the middle. And part of the uh, Jezreel Valley, which is one of the most fertile valleys in the Middle East, is part of it is in Zebulun. Zebulun. Gath Hethfer is in the northeast. It's northeast of Megiddo. It's east of Babylon. Mount Carmel is also to the west. And the Jezreel Valley is part of it. So now we have to consider Jonah. He's living there and doesn't say how wealthy he was, but he's living there and God comes to him and he says, I want you to go up to Nineveh and preach their destruction and 40 days they're going to be destroyed. <laughs> no, Lord, I'm not going up there. You know what kind of people those are, right? I mean, they've come here before, they capture people and they, what do they do? They put out their eyes and take them home as slaves or they just kill them on the spot. I'm not going up there. And I don't want to go there anyway. So what does he do? He says, I'm not going there. I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'm going as far away as I can get. So he travels and travels. He gets to Joppa. There's the ships there. They're getting ready to leave. He says, can I get passage on your boat to Tarshish? Sure. He pays the fee and he gets on board and they take off. They get out to sea and a storm comes up. This isn't the same, you don't know, there's no meteorologist there to say, well, there's storms coming, there isn't storms, it's safe. But you can imagine the Mediterranean, they head out, they're going along, they often they would row to get away from land, and once they got away from land, they could put the sails up, and the sails would catch, and they could go. And a storm comes up. And they're tossing, and... They're worried, boy, it's getting bad, and it just keeps getting worse and worse, and finally it's like the ship is taken on water. We've got to lighten the ship. So they're throwing their wares overboard to lighten the ship so they don't sink. And they're praying to their gods. Now these Phoenician sailors, they had all kinds of gods. There's Dagon, the, the fish god. There's uh, Poseidon, the god of the ocean. And they're praying to their gods to save them, and nothing's working. And the captain, he goes below decks, and what's he find? Jonah.
Jonah, get up. What are you sleeping for? How can you be sleeping in this storm? We're about to die. Get up and pray to your God that he would save us. You know of anybody else who slept in the bottom of the boat during the storm? So Jonah gets up and he prays too. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. And finally they said, somebody on this ship has done something that has angered the gods and we got to figure out who it is. So they, they throw lots to find out who it is. Now I don't know how lots work, but I'm assuming it's something like drawing the short straw. And it comes up, of course, God makes sure, comes up with Jonah. And they say, okay, Jonah, what did you do that angered God or angered the gods? And so Jonah confesses, and he tells them, God wants me to go to Nineveh and to warn them that, you know, he's going to destroy them, and I don't want to go, so I'm going to Tarshish. And they're like, what can we do to save ourselves? And he said, you can throw me overboard. And they're like, no, we're not going to throw you overboard. We can't do that. So they start praying again. And Jonah says, the only thing that's going to work if you throw me overboard. And they're like, we don't want to be responsible for your death. I mean, everybody's, that's, that's one of the commandments that is he observed everywhere. Thou shalt not kill. They know that God is watching them and they certainly don't want to kill while he's watching or at least they know that he's watching so they don't want to throw him overboard so the storm just keeps getting worse and finally they come to the th and so they start praying making sacrifices to God to Jonah's God and they said please don't hold us accountable for this and they throw Jonah's overboard and immediately the storm Calm. The sea calms. You know, I've been out on Lake Michigan, and we had four-foot waves that day I was out there, and it was a beautiful fall day. And they said, oh, yeah, we had a storm a couple of days ago, so the waves haven't calmed down yet. Well, they're, in the, they're out here, they're in the Mediterranean, and they're in this terrible storm, and as soon as they throw Joan overboard, the sea gets calm. You can imagine that they followed Jonas as God from then on. So Jonah ends up in the water and the fish comes up and gobbles him up. Jonah, the second chapter. It says, when Jonah prayed to the Lord, his name, Lord his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Shoel, I cried, and thou didst hear my voice, for thou didst cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood was around me. All thy waves and thy billows passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out from thy presence how can I again look upon the holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep was around about me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I was at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet thou didst bring my life from the pit, O Lord my God, when my soul fainteth within me. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to thee into the holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols, forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to thee what I have vowed I will pay. Delivery belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah on dry land. Could you imagine being a fisherman standing on the shoreline, and you see something coming up, waves Something fish come up pushing the waves and he spits out this man on the beach. And then the fish back out to sea. Can you imagine what that poor man must, what he must have looked like? Seaweed wrapped around his head? That's quite a tale. Immediately God says, Go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, Yes, sir, I'm on my way. 
Jonah gets to Nineveh. And my Bible says it's three days to cross Nineveh, the way it sounds. But what it really means is it's three days to walk all the streets of Nineveh. So he walks the streets of Nineveh and he cries out, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Nineveh will be destroyed. And, you know, he's kind of happy about it because it's going to be destroyed. These are the enemy, after all. These are the terrorists of, the, of those ages. So he does what he's supposed to do, travels the city crying out. Now, I told you earlier that the people of Nineveh, or the Assyrians' people in general, adopted everybody's gods, and they worshipped them all. So when Jonah came and says, God says your city is going to be destroyed, they believed him. They took it to heart. And the word got around from the people to the rulers on up to the king. And the king says, all right, God's going to destroy our city. We have to repent. We have to go put on sackcloth and ashes. Everybody's going to fast, including the animals. And he even put sackcloth on the animals and ashes. And they all sat around and they asked God to forgive them and to, and to, uh, to spare them. Meanwhile, Jonah goes up on the hill. His job is done. He goes up on the nearby hill, builds himself a little booth to get some shade, and sits down to wait for the fireworks. And what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. Day after day, nothing happens. The 40 days are up. And now he's angry. You know, in order to be a prophet... Your prophecies have to come true. Jonah's prophecy didn't come true. How is that going to be taken back in Israel when he goes home? He's mad. Lord, just like Elijah said, just kill me now. Just put me out of my misery. God puts a plant there. This plant comes up over his booth, puts out big leaves, shades him. It's so nice. Oh, he loves that shade. Feels so good in that hot desert sun. The next day, God sends a worm. And the worm eats off the plant, and the plant dies and shrivels up. And Jonah's again sitting there in the heat, the sun beating down, and he says, just kill me, Lord. And God says, Jonah, why are you angry? You had compassion on yourself when you had the shade and you enjoyed it so much. And, now the, and that was a natural thing. And then this, this bug comes along, this worm, and kills it. And now you're complaining again. How can you have so much compassion on yourself and the loss of comfort being aware of what a faulty child of God you are, then how much more compassion will the Almighty God have on a people who are utterly ignorant from all right and wrong? You see, what is the message of this story? Is this just a story to tell the kids? Now, the message of this story is to love your enemies. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies, too. You know, Abraham Lincoln used to say the best way to take care of an enemy is to make him your friend. <laughs> Go out and get, find something in common and share and get to know each other. You know, several things here. Jonah is the only biblical prophet who only made one prophecy and that prophecy was not fulfilled. He was also the only Old Testament prophecy specifically commissioned to be a witness to the Gentiles, as was Paul. Jonah was the only biblical prophet to run from his call by God. And I, I don't know if I agree with that one, because I think Paul ran too. He was still known as Saul at the time, but his conscience was telling him that what he was doing was wrong, but he was running from that. And finally God had to knock him off his donkey and say, why are you fighting me? You know what's right. 
He was one of four Old Testament prophets whose ministries were referred to by Jesus in the New Testament. Jonah is referred to in Matthew 12, 41, our scripture reading. Elijah in Matthew 14, 11, and 12, or Matthew 17, excuse me. Elisha in Luke 4, 27, and Isaiah in Matthew 15, 7. Now, Jonah was from Gath, Hesper in Zebulun, north of Nazareth, in Galilee. Thus, the Pharisees were in error when concerning their statement recorded in John 7, 52, saying, search and look, out of Galilee arises no prophet. They completely forgot about Jonah. Jonah can be compared with Simon Peter on one occasion. In Joppa, God called Jonah, a Hebrew prophet, to minister to the Gentiles. He disobeyed. In Joppa, God called Peter, a Hebrew apostle, to minister to the Gentiles. He obeyed. See Acts 10. Jonah can be paired to John Mark on one occasion. John Mark failed God the first time, but was allowed a second chance and succeeded. Jonah failed God the first time, but was allowed a second chance and succeeded also. Jonah's testimony inside the fish is really a summary of the entire Bible. In despair, he cries out, salvation is of the Lord. This book, for its size, records more miracles than any other biblical book. No less than eight miracles in 48 verses, averaging one miracle for every six verses. Note the wind, the calm, the sea creature, the survival in the sea creature, the release from the sea creature, the gourd that grew up overnight, the worm that killed it, and the east wind. This, God, this book also shows God's foreign missionary program was in existence centuries prior to the Great Commission of Matthew. Jonah is read every year by the Jews on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Finally, the book of Jonah vividly demonstrates that out of God's vastness and marvelous created universe, the only speck of matter that can say no to its creator is man. The wind obeys him. The ocean obeys him, the fish obeyed him, the gourd obeyed him, and the worm obeyed him. I think it behooves us to also obey him. Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for the many things you've done for us. We ask, Lord, that you remember those who have suffered on this day 20 years ago. Be with them, be with those families that when they grieve. Help this country to heal, Lord, in some way that we can be better people. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with those in Haiti who may be in danger. We know that you're already there and you've probably answered our prayer even before we prayed it. But Lord, we want to hear about it from missionaries in the future of how they were saved. We ask you to be with each and every one of us this week. In thy name, amen.